Hi everyone. Um, I welcome all of you to uh, this third presentation at our Interdisciplinary Research Hub. Uh, today's presentation will be on Ibn Arabi and uh, the Voyage of Noah by Professor Nukhet Khardam. Uh, before I introduce our uh, topic and our speaker, um, there are a few uh, announcements about uh, MIAS events that are forthcoming that I'd like to make. Um, so firstly, um, from the 5th of June to the 26th, uh, there's a series of seminars. There'll be three seminars uh, followed by a panel discussion. Um, and it's, it, it's entitled um, uh, Justice and Harmony in the Works of Ibn Arabi and the Akbari Tradition. So there are really interesting topics and presentations and uh, the details are up on the website. So I urge all of you to, to check that out. And also um, Hina, who is with us, would, um, who is with the, uh, the research hub, uh, would be presenting on the 5th of June in that, in that series of seminars. And uh, she's presenting on uh, the Wali in Islam and the Bodhisattva in Buddhism. So I'm really looking forward to that. So it'd be really interesting. So, so I urge all of you to uh, check the details on the site. Um, secondly, and this is a reminder, uh, the uh, the members of the uh, to the members of the Ibn Arabi Society, uh, there's a uh, there's a member meeting on the 22nd of May in which there are some interesting presentations and discussions, even regarding the the research hub. So that's just a reminder about about that. Uh, and thirdly, about the research hub, um, the book club uh, is still in the works. So uh, if you have any, uh, if you want to contribute to uh, the structure of the club, what we should read, how we should go about it, I welcome you to participate um, and to contribute. So, so yes, those are the announcements. And now for our talk and to our speaker. So, sorry, Bharatwaj, before you introduce um, Nukhat, yeah. thank you for that, Sam, thank you for the announcement. Yeah. I just wanted um, Hassan to just say a quick hello because it's the first time he joins us. Hassan, uh, can you hear me? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hassan. Can you, can you tell us where you're joining us from? I'm from Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Um, Hassan reached out to me in, through the uh, Facebook Messenger and sent a couple of posts on, on the MIAS Facebook and has a great interest in, in Ibn Arabi. So you're more than welcome to join us and uh, hopefully we will see you in different occasions, inshallah. And thank you, Bahar Tawaj, for getting in touch with each other. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Would you like to introduce Nukhat for us, please? Yes. Uh, so uh, today's presenter is uh, Professor Nukhat Kardam. Uh, it's uh, it's a real honor for me to introduce uh, uh, Professor Professor Kardam. Um, she's she's an emeritus professor at uh, Middlebury Institute of International Studies in California, and uh, throughout her career, she has been engaging with uh, questions of gender equality. Uh, gender norms, identity, women's rights, and so on, uh, through her uh, research and teaching, uh, through her publications and books, and even through active engagement on the ground uh, with uh, human rights projects and programs. Um, she's also worked as an international gender consultant with various uh, UN agencies and has been invited to uh, UN expert committee meetings on uh, gender norms and policies throughout, throughout her career. Uh, she's a follower of the uh, Melami path of uh, Tasawwuf, of Sufism, for many years. Uh, she's uh, deeply inspired uh, by the works of Ibn Arabi. And, um, and, uh, and more recently, she has been uh, conducting workshops on uh, creativity, co-creativity, etc., through the inspiration of um, the works of Ibn Arabi. And... Um, it, in addition to, to that, she's also a composer of poetry. And, um, and as someone who has uh, both read and heard uh, her poems, uh, I, I can say that they're really beautiful and really inspired. And um, to repeat myself, I'm really honored to invite Professor Kardam to present her talk. I hand it over to you, Professor Kardam. 
Thank you so much. That was such a kind, beautiful uh, introduction. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And it feels like I'm among friends because I already know most of you. So this is a, a beautiful opportunity. Thank you for inviting me, Rim, to, to explore the various levels of meanings and interpretations of Noah's uh, voyage as expounded by uh, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi in The Secrets of Voyaging. Of course, um, while I prepared for this talk, I thought that I should also look at some other um, books. So I consulted the Bezels of Wisdom and uh, uh, of course, Angela Jeffrey's commentary in The Secrets of Voyaging is excellent. So I was also benefiting from that. And of course, I benefited from all the courses that RIM has been uh, providing for us. I feel so, so fortunate. So, um, but as we well know, knowing Ibn Arabi, understanding Ibn Arabi is uh, like a great adventure. I mean, it's a, it's a huge adventure and I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. Uh, so please forgive my mistakes. And this is just a small attempt to try to understand and interpret Noah's voyage. Uh, so this is, this is where I am with it. Um, and let me share my screen so that you can show, I can show you my um, PowerPoint here. You can see it, right? Excellent. Um, so uh, let me start with uh, the conventional understanding of Noah's voyage and then move on to Ibn Arabi's multi-layered interpretations, what I have understood and share a little of my own journey. Uh, from uh, drawing from these interpretations. So, are you ready? Here we go. <laughs> so, um, well, why can't I go down now here? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to... There. Uh, so, we know uh, from the Quran that the prophet Noah receives a sign from God and calls on his people to obey him. But what does his people do? They do his people do, they cover their eyes and pull their garments over their eyes, uh, bodies, and they don't heed the call. In the Surah 71, Surah Noah of the Quran, the words of the divine are the following, quote, Truly, we sent Noah to his folk saying, warn your folk before a painful punishment approaches them. He said, oh my folk, try, truly, I'm a clear warner to you. Worship God and be God-fearing of him and obey me, unquote. But they laid their fingertips over their ears and covered themselves with their garments. So Noah's uh, people continued to worship their, idol, their idols, their many gods, instead of the one God was calling them to. Noah was then instructed to construct a ship under God's eyes by and by his revelation. And the divine indicated in the following Surah Hud, a uh, quote, and craft the ship under our eyes and by our revelation and address me not for those who did wrong. They are truly ones who will be drowned. So please pay attention to the word drown because I'm going to go into to that as well, interpretation of drowning. As the Surah Hud also points out, the oven boiled. Again, please keep in mind the boiling oven, also referred to as the Tanur, T-A-N-N-U-R, as we will talk about it later. The famous floods came. Again, quotation from the Quran, quote, our command drew, drew near and the oven boiled. We said, carry in it the ark you constructed, every living thing, a mate, two and your, or your, your people. And he said, embark in it. In the name of God will be the course of the ship and its burden. Truly, my Lord is forgiving, compassionate. So, as we know, According to this story, the ark lands on Mount Judy after the floods subside, where those that had embarked disembark uh, to go forth in pairs and multiply. 
So uh, this is the question, this is the story. The question, the first question that uh, I'd like to address, the question that Ibn Arabi addresses is why did these people cover their ears? That's the first question. Why did they cover their ears? Why did they lay their fingertips in their ears, cover themselves? And Ibn Arabi's answer is because Noah called his people to the path of God's transcendence, not imminence, whereas reality is both transcendent and imminent. Transcendent means worshiping God, even if you don't see him, because his essence is unknowable, while imminent means he is manifest through his attributes in this world. Brief note on Ibn Arabi's cosmology, which I think everyone knows here, but of course we know that Ibn Arabi, for Ibn Arabi, all existence is one, and that God's essence cannot be known, but his attributes, his names are manifest in this world. So God manifests himself through his attributes. Without God, there is no world. At the same time, the only way God manifests himself is through this world, through the attributes. Therefore, reality encompasses unity and multiplicity, both transcendence and imminence. It's both temporal and eternal. It's both existence, existent and non-existent. This is the paradox of the reality for Ibn Arabi. So what Ibn Arabi says, as I understand it, is that Noah's people worshipped these idols, their individual gods, if they had only known that in fact these individual gods were also manifestations of God, manifestations of his attributes, of the one God, then they would not have closed their ears to Noah. Furthermore, calling people to the path of transcendence obliterates any knowledge of the creator. Knowledge in relation to created beings is what we know. Knowledge is only possible in terms of the signs on the horizons and in oneself. God's knowledge, God's essence cannot be known. So Noah, according to Ibn Arabi, did not call to his people from both the transcendence and imminence. Uh, instead, he, uh, Ibn Arabi sees Noah as clinging to a one-sided version of reality that is seeing God as transcendent, tanzih, and not imminent, tashbih. So that's why his people covered their ears, according to, to Ibn Arabi. Moving on, the people who did not heed Noah's call were drowned. But what does drowning mean? Did the people really drown? That's the next question. But I can't get this to move properly <laughs> for some reason. I'm sorry. Why is that not happening? Do you want to maybe close it and open it again? Sometimes it freezes mm -hmm. when you are doing a presentation. You can close and then reopen if you want, or close sharing. Yeah, let me do that for one second. My apologies. Here we are. You see it, right? Uh, so, so drowning, what does drowning uh, mean? What does drowning mean? Um, Ibn Arabi has a very controversial interpretation of drowning, um, it seems to me, because he did not see the people who are drowning as sinful and to be punished. On the contrary, uh, his interpretation is, is quite different that perhaps drowning, and I drew also got this from Angela Jeffrey's commentary, perhaps drowning means that people were in perplexity. Maybe they were in bewilderment. 
So Ibn Arabi may be suggesting that these pe the people are thrown into the waves and they're struggling. This is our general state in the world, don't you think? I mean, we are all struggling in these waves. So in, in a different way of looking at it, you could say that we're struggling in a world of opposites. The world of opposites. So, uh, but in fact, Ibn Arabi says that the world is not a world of opposites, but it's a world of complementary contraries. So whether it's life and death, whether it's expansion or contraction, whether it's man and woman, they each contain each other and they are in a state of fluidity. So the world, uh, if we see it in terms of one, opposite, one or the other, then we are stuck in a world of duality. And uh, I personally believe that most of our suffering in this world comes from the fact that we are stuck in a world of duality. I've studied uh, in identities for a long time. And I think that uh, our identities, the problem with our identities is that we see, uh, we see things as this and not that. And as soon as we do that, then we are uh, seeing the world in a black and white terms. And uh, I think this is a whole important topic in itself uh, that uh, requires much more exploration. But uh, this is something very close to my heart. Um, and uh, in order to be able to see the world from complementary contraries, I think we also need to be able to see that there's an underlying consciousness under it all that we, can, we have access to. And when we go there, when we are at that place, then we're able to see the multiplicity uh, without attachments to the opposites, I think. And then we're able to go back and forth between transcendence and imminence. But maybe I'm going ahead of myself here. So I'll, uh, I'll go back to uh, the drowning. And I have one more um, um, one more interpretation of the drowning. So maybe drowning also means that uh, it may signify that we may be asking for help. We may be asking for help from God, for his mercy, for his guidance, for his, in, his, for his inspiration. So maybe that's what drowning means. So that help comes in the form of invitation to construct the ark, the ark of salvation, so I'd like to move on to uh, the invitation to construct the ark. Invitation to construct the ark. The divine speaks in the Surah Hud, know, O subtle secret of the voyager, which the real has affirmed in his way station the way station of his prophet Noah, peace be upon him, that God, may he be magnified and glorified, has fashioned your ark and has built it with his hands and his inspiration. So the process of construction of the ark seems to have multiple meanings, multiple meanings, and I'd like to explore some of them, just a few of them. One, first, is the ark our body? So the ark is our body. Um, Angela Jeffrey quotes from the foot to heart in the Secrets of Origin. Quote, your ark is your bodies on the overflowing sea of the world. You are its riders and you are in danger. You have no shore except decree and destiny. So beseech and make efforts. There is no flight from God. So this is the ark of our own bodies. That's in a, in one interpretation. Second, I'd like to say that the construction of the ark takes time. The process is long and arduous. This path, the constructing itself, involves purifying oneself. According to Ibn Arabi, God said, who are you that the real should descend to you in such a way, especially from the station of the me? Your soul commands the evil, your Satan, your world, your passion. Do not cease to mock you as long as you're constructing this ark, this construction of salvation. So 
it seems like as we're constructing this arc, we have to be very careful. Each piece of wood has to be just in the right place. There is a skill to it. It requires a lot of effort, a lot of discipline. It requires engaging with the construction of it with love. Like Bob Dar says, Bob Dar is, has a boat school, construction of a boat called Arcus. So this path that we're on is very arduous. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, let me see. Uh, Angela Jeffrey says, this is a period of chaos. This construction of the art, a chaos. We have to be very careful. Each, be the, no, not that one. Angela writes, Angela Jeffrey, the human being cannot survive without the ark of salvation. Whatever this may so symbolize for him or her, it's a dark night of the soul. Dark night of the soul. So I'm wondering, as we are constructing this ark and going through this arduous process of the path of salvation, are we dying to ourselves slowly? Is this an experience of fana in the sense of the effacement of personality and understanding that none of this belongs to us anymore? Uh, and is that what would allow us to, to embark therein? So to me, this invitation, this process is something extremely uh, important. And now let's embark therein. Embarking the ark. This uh, Ibn Arabi uh, likens the ark to the throne where the all merciful sits and claims it's the seat of the perfect human being. Since sitting on the throne is an attribute belonging to the real and the human being was created upon his form. He made for him a vessel that he called an ark. Thus, the ark is the seat of the perfect human being. This voyage is imbued with alchemical symbols, such as the Tanur. So Noah's sign from God was made the furnace, furnace, Tanur. The furnace, Tanur, is referred to as the boiling oven in the Quran, which indicates the merging of fire and water or the cycle of fire and water. In fact, I was trying to understand this, so I'm going to quote Angela Jeffrey here, who quotes from the Quran, uh, quote, fire extracts wetness and vapors and begins to rise. Fire becomes vapor again and begins to act in the air like the wheel when it emerges from water. It continues to ascend until it reaches the, the sphere of Zamharir. It condenses as rain by the determination of all the might of Almighty, of the Almighty and all knowing. So fire and water, uh, Noah's people could not see fire and water as uh, as uh, merging, but instead it, they see fire, they saw fire and water as opposites. So you know, it, with the Tanur. There are a lot of symbolisms that I try to explore because in Ibn Arabi's writings, uh, fire symbolizes light and water symbolizes knowledge, which to me means that God's light and his knowledge are one and the same. In other words, the one who receives God's light in his or her heart receives his knowledge. So, so is it true that fire and water light and knowledge also are uh, similar. That's one question I had. Another interpretation, water symbolizes the body and fire symbolizes the spirit. So then the completed human being is one who balances the two, the spirit and the body. Tanur also represents uh, Ta means, uh, comes from tamam, according to Ibn Arabi, which means complete. Nur means light. So therefore, uh, God's light, um, it, when it manifests in the human body, it, it means that we are looking at a completed human being. Ta nur. The other very interesting interpretation I found is tan, also in Turkish, means dawn. So it is going from night into day, that time period, that's the in-between, dawn. 
So uh, it's in between time. And this to me reminded me that completed human being is seen as the Barzakh itself, the Barzakh itself, uniting himself or herself in himself or herself, the higher and lower worlds, the in-between. So in short, I think that uh, Tanur symbolizes an alchemical process of transformation, of completion, of perfection. And then what happens to the Ark? So let's uh, disembark. Disembarking on Mount Judy. So why Mount Judy? Well, uh, Judy, the Jude, the Jude is uh, existence uh, and manifestation. So um, the inhabitants of the Ark become manifest as they disembark into this world. And Jude also apparently is generosity. So its existence relies on this generosity. So there's that aspect. So it seems to me, I may be stretching it here, but it seems to me that the people who disembark are completed human beings, having gone through Tanur, the alchemical transformation, and returned to the sensible world, the world of opposites. But they are now in the stage of Baka, uh, seeing God both as imminent and transcendence, and to be ready uh, to be of service in this world. You could also see the, the opposites or pairs disembarking on Mount Judy. The only way that the pairs could multiply and be fruitful is through uniting. So we're, we're going back to the uniting of the opposites um, here, perhaps. And I remember reading somewhere that uh, as long as the universe contained even one completed human being, that it will continue. <laughs> so maybe these, uh, these people disembark and some of them are complete human beings. We're very fortunate. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, they disembarked in pairs. Now, let me see, um, uh, let me see the next slide here. Uh, Noah's voyage as a cycle of generosity. It's a cycle of generosity. Um, so as you see now, I've gone through the drowning, the invitation to construct the ark, embarking, the reality of Tanur, and disembarking into the pairs, in, in pairs into the world of creation, destruction, and then a, like a continuation of the cycle, a cycle of generosity. So I wondered if, uh, if this is really what, no, uh, what Ibn Arabi is talking about is the journey of um, the perfection of the human soul. Is this what the Noah's uh, voyage is about? A journey of the perfection of the human soul. So Angela Jeffrey says, on the microcosmic level, this journey is a process of uniting the opposites in perfect balance, traveling on the straight path of essential surrender, increasing our knowledge and our virtue our knowledge and our virtue. This is so beautiful. You know, uh, this, this uh, construction of the Ark of Salvation involves increasing our knowledge and increasing our virtue. I love, love this one uh, interpretation of this cycle of generosity. The second thing that Angel Jeffrey points out that I really liked is she says, the seeker's Ark of Salvation, symbol here of the human configuration, has been fashioned by God and its perfecting is carried out under his eyes through his inspiration. While the people mock, symbolic of everything that distracts us, we must continue to trust in the signs and in his knowledge of what that transformation entails. Distractions must perish as the seeker constructs his, his or her ark and sets sail. Amazing. Without removing those distractions, it, it's basically talking about the path. So, so for me, Ibn Arabi perhaps has reinterpreted Noah's voyage for us as a path of salvation for each person 
each person, each one of us could aspire to uh, and has indicated the stages, its process. That's the very cycle of generosity. It's the very cycle of generosity. And then the next question I ask myself is, um, is the cycle time uh, bound or timeless? Because uh, first it seemed to me like, oh, so if, you know, first you um, drown and then no, you don't drown, you get on this ark, then you get embark on it. And then you, you know, like, is this before and after? How does this work? And then, um, and then I realized, wait a minute, it's just like other paradoxes of Ibn Arabi that it is both, you know, it's, it's both timeless and it's also happening in this world. I mean, think about the fact that we die uh, and we are reborn each minute, second, uh, because our cells are constantly dying and being reborn. So our breath also is the same way. So, um, you know, each time uh, we are individuating and then we are letting go as we breathe. So it seems to me, I'm going to end by saying that uh, this Noah's vo voyage, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to dive a little bit more deeply um, and scratching the surface of this, but it really does seem to me like Noah's voyage is the voyage of uh, human perfection or voyage of, you know, evolution of um, the human soul. And the lesson I also draw from this is that uh, as long as we ask for it, we're here for it. As long as we ask for it, we put our intention there and then the action takes place as long as we ask for it. And as long as we ask for that guidance, that guidance, that inspiration, without which we're nothing. Thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>